Great. Hello. Very welcome. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to welcome you very warmly to our public panel discussion on social, social trauma research and teaching on a former battlefield on the 11th of July. And I just learned by Carmen Scheer that this is the day, 11th of July, the Sebrenica Memorial Day. The youngers, youngest uh, participants among us will learn during the uh, lectures uh, what this means, Sebrenica Memorial Day. My name is Martin Teising. I'm the president of the IPU. The results of the DRAD-supported International Research Network, Trauma, Trust and Memory, TTM, Social Trauma and Reconciliation in Psychoanalysis, Psychotherapy and Cultural Memory will be presented tonight. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with DARD, this means German Academic Exchange Service. DARD is our German abbreviation. When I started my presidency in the IPU in October 2012, the TTM project was just installed. It was the very first international project of the IPU and TTM became the heart of the international office, the heart, the core of the international office. We are very thankful to Professor Hamburger, who had the idea to found an international research network, which is, to cite you, building bridges between former war enemies, bridges between East and West, and between psychoanalysis and empirical research. This network of seven participating universities became extremely successful, as you will see. Until today, Professor Hamburger is its spiritus rector. It was a great chance for the IPU that Professor Hamburger found Carmen Scheer, the former founding director of the Goethe Institute in Sarajevo. She had worked and lived in Bosnia from 1999 to 2002. Beginning in 2012, she established then the international office of the IPU, our Goethe Institute. <laughs> Together with Anna Henke, she in initiated many other projects, never forgetting that TTM was the firstborn. Thanks to her initiative, we received the Erasmus Carter, and because of her persistency, she convinced our board to install an English-speaking master course at the IPU, which is another great success. Together with Andreas Hamburger and Carmen Scheer, the presidency of the IPU, feel a strong responsibility to use our special knowledge to foster peace processes by working through what had happened in social conflicts and wars. We do feel this special responsibility as citizens of a country with a terrible history, now living in peace with former war enemies and in high prosperity since more than 70 years. A peace period which is lasting as long as never before in history, at least in Central Europe. My wish to contribute a tiny bit to this task was the reason to follow your kind invitation to chair this evening Besides the fact that I could be a guest at some TTM events during the last years, for example, the visit of the Jewish Museum in Berlin in 2013 and the conference in Banja Luka in 2014. In those days, we did not expect that we would witness the great challenge to welcome refugees of war in the near in Middle East. Experiences and results of your project were used in refugee assistant projects of students and colleagues at the IPU who engaged in this field. I'm happy that now, at the end of my presidency, the outcomes of the TTM projects, project are reflected in the first joint book that has now been published, which, I, here is the book to be seen, <laughs> which in addition to contributions from Vamik Volkan and Mark Solms, also 
presents research results from students in the network. The most important message is that the work will go on. Since 2017, the follow-up follow project, Migration, Trauma in Transition, Exploring Socio-Traumatic Roots of Dealing with Refugees, is financed by the DRD. And now we will hear the following contributions. Carmen Scheer will talk about Bosnian and Herzegovina after the war and the foundation of TTM and MTT, the following project. You, this will be the first speaker. Second speaker, Camelia Hancheva, CST and International Master Course. Then Damir Asenijevic, War Jokes. And Andrea Samburger, Social Trauma, ein hilfreiches Konzept. Is this in German? In English, okay, the title was in German. And uh, I want to introduce very shortly the speakers just before they begin with their contribution. And this book is very helpful, even for this, so I can't, I didn't have to research. So Carmen Scheer has an MA in Comparative Literature, German and Islamic Studies. She is head of the International Office, of course, of the IPU and coordinator of the Trauma Trust and Memory Project. Then, I stole it from there, that you were the founder of the Goethe Institute, and it, you has, she has worked as a German Academic Exchange Service Lecturer for German, European, and Intercultural Studies, and as a manager of international university programs in Canterbury, United Kingdom, Tirana, Albana, and Hanoi in Vietnam with my former colleague Wolfgang Krieg. Okay, please, for your contribution. Thank you very much, Professor Tising. So, welcome from my side as well. And I thought maybe not everyone is aware of the situation uh, the former Yugoslavian states had to face. Therefore, how does that work? Should I just, aha. Uh -huh. Therefore, we, we, we decided to have a map here. So, um, I'd like to give you a very, very short overview of what we are talking about. I mean, it's difficult to talk about the history of the Yugoslavian wars. It's a challenge, because which kind of history are we talking about? Is it the history written in Serbian textbooks? or maybe the history written in Bosnian textbooks, or maybe even the history remembered by Bosnian Serbs. Part of the TTM project always was the collection of oral documents given by inhabitants and witnesses of all parts of former Yugoslavia. Meanwhile, it is internationally uh, recognized six countries, Some people call it seven countries. It's because Kosovo is not exactly uh, acknowledged by uh, the Serbian government. Okay, so but there are some kind of cornerstones most everyone would agree on. Mm -hmm. And maybe you remember the name Tito? He was very famous because he broke with the Soviet Union and therefore, Yugoslavia received a very special treatment from the Western countries for the next 40 years. 1980, Tito died. In the 80s, relations among the six republics, they deteriorated. Slovenia and Croatia moved towards secession. And in the early 90s, there was no effective authority at the federal level of Yugoslavia. Ninety-one, the Yugoslav wars started with a short 10-day war in Slovenia, and numerous wars followed. The most awful and really, really painful and incredibly bad war 
was the siege of Sarajevo, which lasted from 92 until 95. Okay, um, I used to live in Sarajevo from 99 until 2002. I went there the very first time in early 96. And in my perception, Bosnia-Herzegovina and especially Sarajevo was the country and the city without roofs. There was no roof on not a single house in that city. And I had it for the first time in my life that I started understanding what it must have meant to the generation of my parents after World War II. I mean, you can read about wars, but standing in a direct post-war situation makes everything extremely different. So, maybe we show the next picture. That was the situation I found when I arrived in Sarajevo. Everything was broken. This awful Sarajevo war was ended by the Dayton Agreement. That was an agreement set up by the international community to end the war. With that Dayton Agreement, the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs decided to set up the Balkan Stability Pact. That Balkan Stability Pact was introduced to stabilize a post-war situation between all countries involved. And that went as well for university levels. Okay, and that is the academic reconstruction of Southeastern Europe. Within this framework, 1999, after ending of the armed conflicts in Southeastern Europe, the German universities were encouraged to start partnerships with universities from the Balkans. Okay, the idea was to just foster and internationalize junior scientists and scholars and the university situation in every subject. That means there were, there were partnerships in mathematics as in history and with us in psychology. Okay. Um, the Foreign Office, since 1999, had a funding volume from about 33 million euro, and it was 24 project-related partnerships between 160, more than 160 German and South East European higher institutions. The funding with Funny enough, they called it target countries, which is, which is really a tricky word after a war situation. The main countries, the focus, they were Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, Albania, Serbia with Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, and all neighboring countries like Bulgaria, Croatia, Romania, Slovenia, and Hungary were entitled to participate. The aim of the project was to improve the teaching and research and promote junior scientists. Okay. Now, as Professor Teising mentioned, in 2012, Andreas and I found each other in a situation of common interest. For me, it was important to follow the steps for reconciliation and uh, rebuilding Bosnia-Herzegovina for Andreas. It was a more contentional thing, but he will talk about that later. Anyway, we started establishing a transnational network for interdisciplinary and psychoanalytic trauma research. The idea was um, to create 
conditions for the subjective and collective reconciliation. And we had as a special feature of the network studies on cultural processing of collective trauma by means of literature and film analysis. Okay, before I give the word to Camelia, I would like to tell you one very touching event. We started our network. Andreas had found some Serbian professor, that is Professor Alexander Dimitrievich, who is, happens to be here, he's sitting there in the back. And we went to Belgrade for the first time, okay, and we thought and hoped that one of the professors from Sarajevo, Amra, would join us there. Unfortunately, she was sick. And Alexander managed to put her with us, sitting in Belgrade, via Skype. Okay, and it was for me extremely touching that he offered to Amra to publish an article she had written on war rapes in one of the most important Serbian paper. So that is how our network started. Okay, as today is the 11th of July and the Memorial Day of Srebrenica, we would like to show you this picture. Every stone you can see there is meant to remember one of the killed Muslims who were found in mass graves. And our TTM network went there together. That means students and professors from Serbia and from Bosnia. And it was the third group ever who, with Serbian students who visited that memorial. Very, very important. And before I start speaking another 20 hours, I better stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this was a great chance for the audience to have this bonus material, which is not in the book. And uh, we think uh, this was, is a good foundation, I think, for the contributions which will follow now. Uh, Hamilia Ancheva is a dear guest of our university, I think approximately for the 10th time you are staying more here. More or less, 10 times. Okay, as an exchange professor from Sofia, uh, she is a senior assistant, a senior assistant professor in developmental psychology, a psychotherapist, and a supervisor. Her clinical experience is with terminally ill patients, traumatic loss, and developmental psychopathology. Her research interests are early socio-emotional development relational psychoanalysis, and intergenerational transmission of trauma. She leads the Trauma Trust and Memory Network Division for Bulgaria and coordinates the master's study course. This is CST, Social Trauma, and you will talk about this now. Please. Thank you very much, and welcome to all of you who sacrificed a football game for coming to our panel. Um, I would like to start where Carmen Scher ended her talk, because CST is an international master course, and of course, you shouldn't doubt, it has a clear structure, and it has a very important content. But I believe you could read about all the content <coughs> stuff and all the courses. Some of you have experienced it. I see my, some students here uh, from the book. and. I would like to present here more the process of creating the idea of sharing this course among seven universities and having it for four years now. Because this same process started again in Srebrenica. It was a very tiny history of our network on the Balkans 
uh, that was threatened because of the shattering experience. As we all know, in communication, it's quite difficult to stay attuned, and there are many ruptures. And Srebrenica was a kind of rupture in our experience and communication, threatening the existence of the network. Uh, another rupture was the visit of a Jewish museum here in Berlin two years later. But as relational psychoanalysis teaches us, it is not the rupture that is important, but it is the process of renewing communication and attunement. So we decided that it would be important to have a structure to keep our efforts and to give them continuation uh, for the next generation of students so they could benefit from the experience that would otherwise be lost. And the social trauma course uh, came as a structure uniting the efforts of professionals from different backgrounds. And it was also aimed as a course for people from, for master students in all, all humanities. So it was a kind of response to the experience that stayed unnamed and unrecognized. And I remember clearly uh, the feedback from Bulgarian students that were absolutely puzzled how we came with the same symptoms without being in a war situation. What has happened to our society and to our history that we recognize clearly the symptoms of social trauma without being able to name what was the traumatic event? And there came this construct of social trauma that includes totalitarian societies and that could help us explain what is going on in the mentality and experience of people in post-totalitarian societies. Uh, it is really important, the notion that we keep CST an open opportunity for a dialogue. And I would like to make a dialogue a central topic of my talk today, because I see CST not as a next course in every curricula, but as an invitation. It is an invitation to stay connected and to be in dialogue with people across the borders. It is an invitation to talk about things that remained unnamed. I believe topography is a very fruitful metaphor. And after Srebrenica, the topography of our geographical knowledge about the Balkans started to ring differently. And after visiting Jewish Museum, it also started to ring differently. So the topography of our knowledge of who we are and the knowledge of our Balkan identity was enriched during the, this development and during this process of creating and teaching the, the chorus. Uh, I've, I've already said that we are trying to keep the chorus, the, the idea of teaching social trauma open. That means that we are reluctant to set a strict definitions and to keep to certain strict schedule. Everybody from the professors, lecturers, and researchers is invited to share the unique experience because as you see, there are many countries, there are many labels for the experience, and we all share same but also quite different traumatic history. So everybody from humanities, uh, cultural science, political science, and history is invited to give his contribution in the course with a neat structure of, as you see on the, show, on the slideshow, six modules covering what we came to believe the most prominent areas of crossing, crossing points 
of trauma research and other fields of psychology and cultural science. And we are also trying to, to keep the dialogue open, not only between researchers, but what I believe most importantly, to keep the inner dialogue of the participants in the course. And in my opinion, we are quite successful in that because for the fourth year, uh, this elective course is elected with a huge majority in many universities. And I used to ask students who are young people, what brought you here? Why are you so interested in the topic of trauma? Which is not that obvious, neither for their age, nor for their general attitude. Uh, but we know that starting the dialogue within oneself and once giving the opportunity to break the silence against, uh, to break the silence around the concept of trauma seems to attract the attention of young people who could recognize the symptoms and the consequences and who could recognize the importance of getting to know their own history better and the history of their society and the history of their neighbors too. So I would like to think about this course as an invitation for dialogue, as an invitation to people's curiosity to what we know and a questioning and a challenge to what we know and what is known. And again, to what is not known and to use another psychoanalytic concept, I believe the most important, it is an invitation to the unthought known to be discovered on our inner topography. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, questions and uh, discussions we do afterwards together, all these contributions. Our next speaker is Damia Asenijevic. He is for the first time our guest. Very welcome at the IPU. He is an associate professor in literary studies and critical theory in the University of Tuzla in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a psychoanalyst in training and founder of the Tuzla Psychoanalytic Seminar. His artistic and theoretical interventions enhance discussion of painful topics after war and genocide. He edited Unbridgeable Bosnia and Herzegovina, the fight for the commons in 2015. And now you speak about war jokes. Please, Mr. Asinievich. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's working. Thank you very much. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I think I owe um, my gratitude to Andreas, who was true to um, the, the truth of the unconscious and thus invited me to contribute to the volume, um, however difficult and challenging the topic this may have been. Um, I, always, I always find it difficult to speak on the 11th of July um, because the date itself sets very particular precepts and framework for, for talking about genocide. Um, I find it difficult because of um, many years of working with families of missing persons in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And also personally, because it is a very particular day of commemoration in which we, as a society in Bosnia and Herzegovina, try to come to terms um, to what happened um, during the war. And it is really interesting because we don't have the name for that war in Bosnia and Herzegovina as yet. We call it the war. So the war as a very indeterminate signifier just opens the screen for, for many fantasies to be projected onto it. And all the while, this war is still ongoing. 
The conflict, the armed conflict may have stopped, but um, 23 years after the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement, Bosnia is still at war. And I would even go further to say that Bosnia and Herzegovina today is a mass grave of the dead and the living. Because the society is broken up and torn apart and resembles the inside of the mass grave in which the commingled remains of the dead still wait to be identified, put together and buried. And today in Srebrenica is a very particular day, it's the day of burial. It's the day of the burial in which the painful work of associating the remains of people and in certain cases one person can be found in five different mass graves. So it's a, it's a very, it's a product of, of a very painful and painstaking putting together of a person. But what does it mean to say that Bosnia is the mass grave of the dead and the living? It means to actually claim that those who rule over the death and life in Bosnia and Herzegovina are the triad of the scientist, the bureaucrat, and the priest. And in this kind of very articulate governance model in which the forensic science comes together with international bureaucracies and comes together with religious institutions to kind of discover, put together, and then consecrate as ethnic these remains, they in a way create and reify ethnicity as the only model of identity. And by doing so, actually this international management of loss that is carried out in Bosnia and Herzegovina kind of supports the gaze of the perpetrator of the genocide. And why is that so? Because it is only in the fantasy of the perpetrator of the genocide that the victim was hallucinated as the ethnic other who then had to be executed. So by actually reifying ethnicity as the only possible identity position, this international management of loss installs the principle of genocide and genocide becomes genocide in perpetuity. As somebody who's worked for 15 years in Bosnia and Herzegovina on, on these topics and actually as somebody who's worked across former Yugoslavia with families of the missing persons uh, within the International Commission on Missing Persons. Um, the installment of ethnicity is a, such a pernicious um, wager for, for, for Yugoslavia in particular. So in 2007, I, I decided to, um, to open up the commemoration of the International Day of the Missing Persons uh, in Sarajevo. And I invited poets, artists, curators, um, everyday people to come to the parliament and demand from the politicians who sit in the parliament and who know where the locations of the hidden mass graves are. Because these hidden mass graves are the golden investments of the ethnic kleptocracies that are in power today across from Yugoslavia, but in Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular. And whilst <coughs> and during the time when these hidden mass graves are still hidden, and whilst families are kept in postponed mourning, nothing will be, will be resolved. I started working with, um, with the 
with the group of Spomenik, which was the uh, Belgrade-based group. Um, and our position was to start opening up discussions about the war across Yugoslavia. And the position was that you couldn't build a three-dimensional monument to the war, as we called it, war against Yugoslavia, that the only proper monument to the war against Yugoslavia was a public discussion in which each participant will choose to speak or not, as the case may be, about the war. Along those lines, in Bosnia and Herzegovina for two years, I worked with poets, women poets in particular, um, in these settings that I called open classrooms, particularly in communities that were averse to talking about the war and genocide in particular. And through these open classrooms, we, through this seemingly benign analysis of poetry, we then reached very um, intimate stories about loss, about concentration camps, about witnessing to, to, to mass murders, all of which could not be spoken about in public space. So Bosnia and Herzegovina lacks public space, uh, space for speech about war and loss. And what we are actually sorely missing is, is this kind of public language of grief. We don't have it because grief is immediately installed and economized as ethnic loss and then actually ethnic elites tap into it to, to draw pleasure and enjoyment from it. And also it's, there's a very clear political economy of, of, of victimhood. The obverse side of this is the production of the victim. The victim can speak only as the victim and as nothing else. So for instance, particularly women who are waiting, their loved ones, their husbands in particular, are supposed to be sexless monuments to their loss, their life actually being completely disregarded. Because of course, in this set the nationalist fantasies, they're supposed to mourn perennially until their death. Being a psychoanalyst in training, um, during one of these sessions of poetry readings and analysis, I heard a joke about genocide. And you know, that's not something uncommon jokes about the war were something that we all used to, to su survive the, the boredom of war. <laughs> Because war is actually the, the dullest thing ever. And you know, during the war, we used to tell jokes. We, you know, we were, we were talk, telling all these morbid jokes. But that was the first time in 2012 that I heard the joke about genocide. And it took me by surprise. It scared me. It, it, it petrified me completely. But also, I knew that there was something to be, to be followed. And soon enough, in 2012, 11, 12, I decided to set up a working group called um, Jokes for and Genocide. And our aim was to collect the jokes on the war and genocide and analyze them and see what kind of enjoyment they provide and to what extent they stand in relation to the dominant commemorative practices in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So because the time is short, I'm just going to give kind of a brief historical um, trajectory of, 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 of how the group worked. Um, having collected these, the, these jokes, of course now the onus was on us to, to figure out what to do with them. Because, of course, jokes are very intimate. They, 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 they invite very particular safety and intimacy. Uh, and there is a very particular foreplay when it comes to a joke. You are invited. The, you, know, you always start by actually saying, let me tell you a joke. So there is the preparation, of course, of the, you know, for the telling of the joke. Now, the, the, the question was how to translate that 
if at all, into a public setting? And what would that entail? So, I mean, for many, many months we worked with, with theorists, psychoanalysts, curators, trying to figure out what the best format would be for these jokes to be presented as the material and then talked about from some sort of a safety uh, distance. Because, of course, being, living and working in Tuzla, myself, Tuzla has the largest population of genocide survivors, Srebrenica genocide survivors. Um, and we had to be mindful, mindful of, of, of all of this. So we kind of tentatively opened up the first classroom in which we we're going to um, present this and talk about this. Um, and to our surprise, it was, it, it was a great success because then people wanted to engage, people wanted to tell more. And what was very evident and patently evident was that there was no space for people to talk about their wartime experiences. And we, we decided to, to, to continue this. Of course, this kind of work led to the establishment of the psychoanalytic seminar Tuzla. And in particular, um, I worked with a colleague and a co-fellow, uh, Lacanian analyst, Peter Jeffrey Young, who at that point had just finished the translation of Lacan's Seminar 5, the formations of the unconscious into the English language. It's only this year, I think, the, that, that the official translation um, was published. But working on Seminar 5, because the Seminar 5 is all about the jokes, and Lacan actually works on the formation of the unconscious through the joke, um, this, entire, this entire seminar. And our idea was, after we read Freud's Witz book, and we decided to kind of test uh, Freud's Witz book to see actually whether it still holds uh, on the example of these jokes from Bosnia on war and genocide. Um, we decided to expand this work and actually to see how we can work with these jokes, but also actually what kind of um, knowledge we can glean out of these jokes. And thus we decided to posit the joke as a type of a commemorative practice to war and genocide. And this, I'm just going to wrap it up. Um, uh, the whole work is still very contentious, but I think one of the benefits of Freud's insight is that, that the joke pluralizes commemorative discourses and practices that are in Bosnia and Herzegovina today, those dominant ones that actually install the victim as a completely anonymous subject. And against this kind of anonymity, the joke returns the name. Thank you. Thank you very much for this impressive contribution. And now is Andreas Hamburger's turn. He is a professor at the IPU, a psychoanalyst, training analyst and supervisor. Chair of the Trauma Trust and Memory Network, as we already said, and his main research interests are scenic narrative microanalysis. And I think you did this together with Dori Laub, uh, analyzing interviews with Holocaust survivors. And it's time to say that Dori Laub died 10 days ago. We had him with us, I think, two or three years ago. He gave a very impressive lecture about his own history as a survivor of the Holocaust here. Uh, yes, and this is your part of your research work you did with him together. And another field where you work in is literature and film psychoanalysis. Recently, you edited books on film psychoanalysis, supervision, and social trauma. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to give my contribution in English too, uh, unless my English is far from being as flawless and beautiful as yours. But I'm trying to give my best. So, uh, concluding our discussions on social trauma, I, I would just 
tr try to give a short theoretical background or conceptual background to what we mean by the term. Uh, and, uh, you know, Tama nowadays is quite a fashionable term, maybe even inflationarily used. Uh, nowadays, uh, in our consumerist present, everything which is like hard or a hardship or so is called traumatic. So I think we should look back in history uh, at the tra trauma concept. And of course, we will land uh, with Sigmund Freud and his early seduction theory when he thought that all the psychological uh, problems he saw were maybe based in uh, sexual uh, seduction and abuse. And as you all know, he revised it quite quickly. And then uh, trauma came back, but from another angle. It came back from the war experience, the First World War. And of course, the big name here is uh, Shandor Ferenczi, who wrote, and he experienced, as a military doctor, he experienced soldiers who came back from, from the war, deeply traumatized in shell shock states. And this also influenced psychoanalytic theory. I won't go into it. Uh, interestingly, the Shoah, the Second World War Nazi, the Holocaust did not impress uh, psychoanalytic trauma theory as much as could have been expected. There is only one major blow with Eisler's article, uh, the murder of how many of his children must a person be able to endure symptom-free in order to be considered normal. So the title says everything. This was a paper against the German psychiatrists who denied recompensation to uh, concentration camp survivors with the argument they had had the weak condition before. So this is a, a very impressive article, but you don't have, after the war, a real going into the terms, uh, the theory of social trauma in psychoanalytic discourse. Uh, I think the simple explanation is that psychoanalysis was traumatized itself. So it was something like a kind of a shock state. Uh, Prager has identified three phases of uh, the social trauma discourse. First, it has to be acknowledged, then we have to do concepts of it, and then we have to do research. Um, let's step aside and look at psychiatry, general psychiatry and uh, psychology. Here, the trauma discourse starts uh, after World War II, when all these uh, battle uh, veterans came back to the United States, and then the term of cross-stress reaction or transient situational personality disturbance was created, described their conditions. And most interesting, in, uh, in the 68, in the second revision of the DSM, it was omitted. So that's really a, a, a nice miracle. The explanation being quite simple, in this situation, the military psychiatrists did not want to have a diagnostic category, and that's uh, a proven <laughs> fact. They uh, recommended to diagnose um, adjustment reaction to adult life. So that means uh, a shell-shocked uh, soldier has an adjustment problem, no trauma. But it came back then when the veterans started to, to talk about their experiences, and in the 1980, famous revision of DSM-3, we had the introduction of the PTSD as a diagnostic category. The first etiology-based diagnosis, and the only one in DSM. Uh, but they had very hard to define what is it, what is a trauma, and so they had wonderful definitions like uh, a traumatic event which, which would cause significant symptoms of distress in almost everyone. Uh, that means tra tra trauma is what causes trauma. So we have a circular definition here. Uh, quite strange for such an enterprise as DSM-3. In DSM-3R, they tried to revise it, and only in three, DSM-4 in 1994, they started giving like definitions. And interesting, on the side of the, of the event that causes the trauma, you only have physical threatenings, physical conditions. And then you have the, the usual symptom list, so the flashback memories and all this. So uh, very, very strict idea of what is doing damage to the psychic life. And it's only five years ago 
that a non-physical stress factor was introduced in DSM, and this was only sexual violence. So I would say, I hope it's not too politically incorrect, but I think you see the lobbies working. Because the sexual uh, discourse was a public discourse. That very, you could change DSM in this way. But interesting, still being a Holocaust survivor or being a survivor of, of Srebrenica, if you were not physically threatened or witnessed personally, maybe being the child of would not count. It's not sexual and it's so, okay. In, okay, I just uh, have a, a little graph for you. This is uh, the trauma discourse. You, the red line is the mentioning of the word trauma in the full text research in the psychoanalytic writings, the famous PEPWEB. The blue line, the light blue line, is the mentioning in the title of psychoanalytic writings. Uh -huh, okay, what's going on here? And the, the lower lines are the same full text and um, titles in psychiatric literature. So you can see trauma is a psychoanalytic discourse now in the recent decades. Okay, social trauma, I will turn to this now, is as, uh, as different from individual trauma, uh, a situation where purposeful violence socially accepted by the perpetrator's own social group causes damage, not only to individual victims, but to their whole uh, um, environments. And it stamps or it brands not only the victim by victimization, but it brands also the perpetrator. This is, I, I, I created the term of perpetratorization for that. So as a German, as Germans, we know what it means to be Germans in this respect. We have something like an inborn guilt feeling. For, for the Holocaust, the, the term German is like the term perpetrator. So, genocidal disregard of humanity endangers humanity itself, and this is why genocide is written even by voids in the collective memory. And this is, of course, quite a different thing from just individual traumatizations. Vamik Volkan has written beautiful and many, many books about the social trauma, like the core of a social identity, for example, the exodus for Jewish, the crucifixion for Christians, <coughs> uh, Kosovo for Serbians, and uh, I don't know what's going on here with this instrument, and of course the Holocaust for Germans. Uh, our theory, our concept of the social trauma embraces a relational aspect, as Camelia beautifully laid out. We think uh, that uh, social and genocidal traumata are not one-person phenomena. They um, damage uh, the memory building by the extinction, extinction or damaging the resonance body of the cultural environment. So a child growing up has something like a, a resonance body around it, family, friends, uh, the village. And this is also damage. So it, thereby it leads to a long-term denial of the trauma and of its consequences in many cases. This is the so-called uh, conspiracy of silence. And by this also to permanent re-traumatization. So if you have a not acknowledged trauma, you always are again in situations where the scar is scratched up. This, uh, and then uh, this, is, this was the, the core of my research with Dory. Um, we can find the infectiveness of social trauma in the interview situations. So we had these video testimonies with the Holocaust survivors, and we really could demonstrate how the, the unconscious representation of the traumatic voids, of the traumatic uh, uh, fragmentations, also take part of the, on, on the side of the interviewer. And we received it also in our own participation as researchers. So we had lots of, like, uh, parapraxis in our research, and we try to reflect on it. Okay, to sum it up, uh, the environment is part of the disaster, the shared state of mind perpetuates desensibilization, and we have the phenomenon of institutional rejection. This was Dory's first book, Testimony, and this was the book we edited together, Psychoanalysis and Holocaust Testimony in 2017. We did in our group here at IPU much more research in this direction. We had, uh, we tried to, to really go 
uh, into the moments of meeting where these reenactments of the traumatic failures happen in the in the interview situation, there was also a beautiful doctoral dissertation by Yasmin Bleimling, who is still working in our group. And our next book on this in a joint working group is coming out next week. So, returning to our network and to concluding now my contribution, uh, the whole network trauma, trust and memory circles around all the different aspects, being from the cultural perspective, being from a clinical, um, epi not, yes, also epidemiological and developmental perspective of the sequelae, the consequences of this kind of a social traumatic situation. Especially we have developed kind of a mentalization-based model of social trauma, which I will not go into the details now. Maybe we can touch on this uh, in the discussion. And our final coda now is, as uh, Professor Tising has already mentioned, since last year we have tried to translate, to transpone our um, results, our knowledge about social trauma to the topic of migration, because this is a topic that really comes to us now in the in a word sense. You are here. Um, the summer school last year started uh, with a dialogue between trauma researchers from our network and migration practitioners, field workers, uh, who really work with the refugees and the camps, and it was a really very touching and fruitful uh, dialogue. We again made a book out of it, which will come out in December this year. We just submitted the manuscript. That that's the book. They sent us the cover last week. And we have another summer school in September, late September, in Belgrade, on the same topic, again, with the migration experts. These, this time not from the practic practitioner's level, but a bit from the administration's level, because we really want to understand how can we and how can they understand how the traumatic traces within the refugees and the traumatic identity and a traumatic history within the host societies would fit or not fit together, maybe sometimes in a malignant way. So maybe some of you who would like to go to Belgrade, you will come to apply. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I think in the last contribution, Professor Hamburger gave us a very clear conceptualization of social trauma. And uh, to remember, the first phase of working on trauma is its recognition. This is what you mentioned. And I think this is a bridge to both of your contributions, uh, the recognition, and you mentioned the naming. Uh, the naming of um, of the topography, we uh, we know this in our context of the Holocaust. For example, the name of Buchenwald, it has a very romantic sound and a very terrible uh, got a very terrible history. And there are many some other places with a similar thing. And uh, what you mentioned, naming of the war. I learned by you there is still no name of the war. And uh, I think in our case, we make it very easy, one and two, World War One and two. So it's not really a name for this. And what I learned, this is was very interesting, and maybe you can uh, go on with this explanation because of time reasons you stopped it, but you mentioned that to give a name to the victim is a function of a joke. To remember, this was what we learned here and uh, maybe he's a good Lacanian so, so remember also means putting parts of a body together okay are there some questions or remarks on it okay um, can you give examples the, the last piece with the migration of um, uh, you said, said something that the, how does the kind of the actual collective or social trauma in migrants activate um, certain patterns in the host society. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I can give you a very simple example. This is, I'm, I, you know, I'm living in Munich, Bavaria. This is a, a former enemy. Um, 
we had the famous Hauptbahnhof, München Hauptbahnhof, and there were all these people, many of my friends, who welcomed the, the refugee trains there. Of course, I, I like I like it that, that we did that, but of course it means we do, we do not want to be Nazis. So it has to do with our history. And nearly at the same time at St. Linger Torplatz, close to the Hauptbahnhof, and very close to my, to my practice where I'm working, uh, the Pegida demonstrations took place. And there were angry people who said, but finally we should be allowed to say that we, are, we, we fear strangers, we don't like, we don't like them here. And all people of my breed had the feeling, no, they shouldn't be allowed to say this. So again, we are deep into German history. And if we go to other countries, you will, we will also find deep roots of how do we f feel towards a, st a stranger or a forced migrant. So I could go into details because I discussed it with many, many people from the network, uh, and it's different. The German experience is not the same as the Bulgarian, the Serbian, the Bosnian, and so on. So this is what I meant. Okay. Maybe I may ask you for an example. I think we stopped you before you came to an example, naming the victim in a joke or something like this. And then I saw you. Okay. Is it possible? Yeah, okay. absolutely. I mean, I'd, okay. I'd, 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 I don't want to hog the space from, from the audience because I think, you know, I'm not sure how to include the, the people. So what did I mean by, by, by this? Obviously, in, in, the, uh, in the article, we have um, the joke on, on naming. And I'm not going to tell the joke about the war and genocide. And, you know, you'll have to, you'll have to read the, um, the article. What is interesting is that the ethnic victim as such is anonymous. The only way that you function within the dominant commemorative regimes that produce the ethnic victim is that you are tied to the blood and soil, and that there is no way of mourning you differently. So, for instance, Muslims who were executed in genocide and I'm, I'm now referring from, from Priedor all the way to, to, to the Podrine region, had to be hallucinated as the Islamic other, per se. But of course, this is a very particular, Muslim in Yugoslavia was a very particular identity position. It was a secular Muslim, not necessarily an Islamic Muslim. It was the name of the political people that was forged in the revolution of World War II, in the anti-fascist struggle. So, of course, now if you reassociate the body that was killed as capital M Muslim and bury it and as the Islamicized Bosniak, in that whole procedure there is the ideology that actually explains away and does away from the identity position that that person assumed in Yugoslavia. I don't know if this is clear. I'm talking about a very particular ideolog uh, ideological mechanism that installs ethnicity that may have existed during Yugoslavia, and I'm not saying that ethnicity was not the only position available, but I'm talking about that in terms of you being a subject, that wasn't the only reference of your identification. And now, being identified and buried in this nexus of ethnicity and religion creates an ideological problem for the future, I think. You know? And it, it, it is a very dangerous position. And for me, that is a ticking bomb in our society. And that actually, that is something that worries me. You know, so, and for, for me, the question is, and, and, I, and I work with young artists, is how to intervene in the dominant commemorative regimes 
that are not closed in this kind of self-perpetuating vicious circle of, of, of jouissance, of, of, of ethnicity and of the spectacle. And in this commemorative regimes that are ongoing now, the spectacle is what reigns, right? It is, it, you're, you're supposed to, you, you, what are the positions that you are invited into when you commemorate? You can either be a silent witness without the position to speak, you, you can enjoy the spectacle of commemoration, or you can be a cynical witness and disavow all of this knowledge of how these people came to be killed, and yet accept their burial as the only possible one. Right? So the, the question is, you know, what is the what, what, what is the tertium datur? You know, what is always the 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 disavowed position in 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 the dominant regimes that, that that's not being talked about. I mean, and this is what the joke produces the, the, the greatest anxiety. I mean, I remember in Sarajevo when I gave this, this talk about jokes and genocide, um, my colleagues from philosophy, de from psychology department, just adamantly refused to accept that there is a joke on genocide. You know, of course it creates a lot of anxiety but isn't it all the more the reason to actually, isn't that our task, actually, to circumscribe the, this kind of anxiety? And, you know, my, my worry is that on the surface, and of course Bosnia, I mean, you know, the population in Bosnia is, is marred by different problems. I mean, I'll give, you, I'll give you just an example of this march. I worked... Um, on um, youth radicalization in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, we are talking about the far-right radicalization all the way to Salafi Islamic radicalization, you know, on, on, on the same spectrum. Um, and I was, I was in, in this town of Zenica. You know, talking to these young people who are now in their early 20s, um, and my, my, whole, my whole spiel was... Um, humor and uh, you know how do we talk about Islamic radicalization through humor and the, there was a wonderful BBC series that, that got banned actually um, talking about all these women wearing um, blow up you know sweaters and, 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 and what not I mean really d deeply comic and um, my, my position was whether we are supposed to use this material or not and how do we use this material and a young woman starts speaking and she says this. She said, um, my younger brother, who is now 18, went to the village of Ahmici, where our family house is. And Ahmici village is the central Bosnia village in which uh, the Croatian military forces actually burned people alive in their houses. So, she says, my brother went to, to our family house, reconstructed family house in Ahmici, and he went with his friends. And, um, you know, they're 18, they're having fun, you know, loads of beer, music. And the neighbor came, knocked on the door, and he said to them, you have to stop this music. Do you know where you are? And the brother was, you know, young person, his mother is the only survivor of the entire family of Ahmici. So Ahmici now functions as a graveyard. You're not supposed to live there. Even though there are houses refurbished, there are people living there, but they live as if they lived in a cemetery. And the next thing this woman says to me, and she says, and the other day I switched on the television and I saw my neighbor who got killed in Syria as a fighter for ISIS. What is horrific about this? I mean, the, the, what, what, what is horrific about this is that this is a part of one sentence. That 
all these experiences are congealed, that there is no separation, it's completely commingled, that there is no, everything is one continuum. So, so I mean, for me, this is the work that, 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 that we have to start actually putting some space and enabling these young people to speak about what it means for them to live in Bosnia today. And then we have another directly. I think it's a beautiful example for what I meant about the damage to the resonance body, the, the environment, because I always, as a clinical psychologist, I always think about mentalization, parents, grandparents, and, and siblings, and so, but you have the cultural environment, me, meaning that people, in their jokes, you have always the they and we structure. So the Bosniaks, the Muslims, and the Christians. And this makes a division between persons who were not divided before. So if I ask my Bosnian friends, what are you, they, they don't know what to say because they have a huge list of possible identities. They could just verge at this point. The joke shows or destabilizes the structure, the you and me structure, the division. And if you think of a resonance body like in a guitar or a violin, it cannot work if it's blocked like this, if it's just a digital one or zero. And this is what the, the joke cracks up. Thank you, it's a wonderful example. Um, yeah, <clears throat> it's uh, a far away gun. <laughs> uh, since I thought of my question, but it was also uh, directed towards you, Mr. Hamburger. It was about the concept of social trauma. And you said something um, about perpetratorization or something. I don't know whether I got this word right or not. But um, it made me stumble, so I actually stopped listening and um, thought about it, so I didn't quite get what you were saying about this. I don't understand whether it is um, something, uh, a label put on from the victim group, or is it a label that you put on yourself um, just as you said, uh, your example of the Munich train station, um, I, I would like to know how it works in the whole relation in social, tra uh, social trauma. So is it, does it go in an analog way with the victim's trauma? Or... Um, does the perpetrator have to be uh, defined in order to um, make the victim, victim's trauma a trauma? So it, it, it wasn't very clear to me how it works because you went through it very quickly. I also just answer in a short example which makes it pretty clear, I do hope. Um, um, once I had a, a group on, on Jews and non-Jews in Munich uh, at the 50th anniversary of the Reichskristallnacht, so it was in 1988. You were quite young then, <laughs> I think. So, uh, and one participant uh, gave an example that in his family, his father's birthday was never celebrated and he did not know why. Uh, and then it came out, the birthday was on April 20th. You won't understand it possibly. This is Führer's Geburtstag, Hitler's birthday. It was a big celebration during the Nazi times. But the father, who was an SS officer, he did not talk about it, but he lived his family life without celebrating his own birthday. So this is perpetratorization. He, he was like, he, he became the, the, the mask or some, something empty by this. And of course, it's much less politically correct or acceptable to think about the damages done to the perpetrator, but they exist. And the guy who told this in the group was the, the child. He was a small child, and he did never understand why father was so depressed when his birthday came. Okay, here, here, there was a, yeah, please. Um, very much interested 
and the concept of social trauma as well. And you showed us um, the like the lines where you could very obviously see that the concept of trauma is, is quite new in our understanding and in our consciousness. And I'm very much interested in the leaps of what happened in, in human consciousness to take that step from individual trauma, to understand the individual trauma, to take that step to collective, social and uh, intergenerational trauma that you mentioned as well. And so that is like one part of the question. And the other part of the question is, are there like healing methodologies that we have available by this time that are different to what we know like commonly for individual trauma healing, for example? Yes, of course. In, in, I, I won't go into individual trauma healing now because there's the huge field of trauma therapy and everything is there and is known. In social trauma, I think uh, the healing intervention is to not separate oneself from the other. So, because this is the re-traumatization, you are the patient, you are the traumatized, you are the victim, you are the Muslim, and so on. Uh, th this is like the, the re incination I, I, I know it in my work with socially traumatized persons, and I know it in my research on this, that you have to involve yourself. That, that helps, because then there is an open space where, where things can, um, can be addressed. And for the first part of your question, interestingly, the trauma discourse, which rules a bit... It, it was earlier, it was even in the beginning of the 19th century, was started always by social trauma. So the first, uh, um, it, it came to the light with the, with the railways, the, the railway accidents, that were the first in, uh, incidents where the, the, the surgical concept of trauma, which is a body lesion, was uh, metaphorically used for some kind of mental illnesses, but then the theory still was it must be kind of a physical impact on the brain which makes the symptoms and only Ferenczi was the one to, to tell us, no, it maybe is a psychological thing. So I think the root is the social trauma and only then it was transferred to individuals because the, the railway was so, you know, it was such a, a terrible technology. It was an overwhelming machine. Maybe the... Uh, second part of your question was how to work, uh, how to mourn on social trauma. Maybe you agree that w one part of this could be uh, picking up your picture, your, your metaphor of we are living on a graveyard. Uh, an artist in our country uh, does this, uh, this action of Stolpersteine. Everybody knows it meanwhile. This is bringing making conscious that we are living on a, uh, on a graveyard, showing the naming, naming those who are under the earth now. And this is an artistic contribution, I think, uh, in working on social trauma in a certain way, I think. But tiny part, of course. But. Renaming. Renaming and revisiting the memories and the unconscious memories of your generation, previous generation. So it is reflection as a general process. And, and, and don't, don't put away the, th the, the part that is disturbing. For example, you mentioned the Stolpersteine, which is of course a very good idea. But we in Munich, we have uh, Charlotte Knoblauch. She is the president of the um, Jewish community, and she is fiercely against the Stolpersteine. You know, this is stones p putting in the, in the pavements, because she says this is imposed on the Jewish history, this is you are stepping on the victims, and, and, and. And for me, I'm undecided, and I think, okay, I think we have to stir up the difficulty that arises the moment we try to solve it. Because I think the Stolperstein is a very good idea, but still you will step on someone's wounds automatically. And I think we should just accept the irreducibility of the thing. Just another memory. Um, 
uh, as I told you, Jewish museum experience was quite a shattering uh, experience. And I don't know how many of you have visited this place, uh, but there is this awful and controversial invitation. There are faces uh, made out of metal and you are invited, uh, they're scattered around a huge space and you are invited to step on them. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, it is controversial. And so you may feel invited and there is this practice to go and step on these faces. And the idea and the, the controversy in the invitation is if you refuse to go and explore and revisit, they will remain silent forever. That's the alternative. Yes, that's the alternative. So thank you for the speakers and the organizers. I um, have a question, something like an inner dilemma to share. Um, I would like to think together with you, what is it that we can do in order to think and talk about these topics with groups of people that are not with us today. Um, I organize events about psychology and psychoanalysis and the room is full. And um, people who are there are psychology students or people who study cultural theory or journalism. And I'm excited all the time, I meet interesting people, but somehow I have a feeling that it's just us speaking with ourselves. And um, I was wondering, what is it that we can do in order to connect our community with potential members of Pegida protests? What is it that we can do to prevent that from continuing to happen? Who has an answer? I did not hear. I, I go online, it was my, um, like going online and sharing with these opinions to uh, maybe meet uh, with lots of people and not just a room of people, you can use the advantage. Actually, may I ask a question? Um, you talked before about this um, trauma that has been um, delivered from one generation to the other, and you described how in a city, in a village, it can be uh, even not possible to live a normal life anymore because people have been burned, set on fire there. We are, we are not supposed to live. And um, since I live in Berlin, it's almost two years now, I uh, realize a um, sense of big fear in lots of people. Like, um, even in everyday kind of situations, people are so afraid to do some kind of mistake. They want to make sure that everything is all right and every uh, uh, authorization is checked, paperwork, blah, blah, blah. And even if there's something small, like it's not the uh, end of the world the other day, but people are terrified to do something. And um, how do you think that general culture can overcome this feeling? Um, this is... <laughs> This is one, and um, the second is, I'm really curious about uh, um, the limit uh, in between. Um, I was really interested in post-traumatic growth. Do you, have you heard about post-traumatic growth? The psych uh, positive psychologists um, are researching on this subject. Why do the majority of people who had been in tra traumatic um, experiences don't develop uh, any kind of uh, big disturbance or something? How does the, the what does, what helps these people keep going and find a purpose in life and keep going on and do whatever they find meaningful? Um, so this is also another um, perspective that you don't um, only look from the Störungsseite, uh, but uh, on the positive side. And how do you how do you see how do you differentiate between the 
line in between? How can we switch to the other side, so to speak, if you can? Maybe we can have a closing round now that picking up the questions, everybody can contribute to the questions or whatever comes to your mind here in the, on the, on the floor, on the panel is here, floor is there. Okay, who will start? Who has an idea to the questions and... Yeah. Um, th thank you. Both, I, I think actually I heard both of you asking the same thing. And um, to me, th this is the most irritating bit about living and working in Bosnia. Uh, but what I have learned is to trust, actually to trust the parapraxis, actually to trust that there is a lot of hum happening that we don't recognize as speech. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. The, the, the book that's the, the, that's kind of been hanging in the air around this, and you know that is a flip side of the joke book. It's a um, Charlotte Berat book on the Third Reichs of Dreams, which is a fantastic book, and I think it's the book that hasn't been talked about enough. It is in English. It's in French and in English as well, um, and I think if we engaged people to share. And, and talk about these kind of parapraxis, rather than just kind of, I mean, nobody's going to come to you and say, you know, I open up a, a thing and say, okay, today we are going to talk about trauma. You know, I'm in Bosnia and Herzegovina, if I want to talk about trauma, I'm a mastodont. You know, I'm a dinosaur who hasn't moved on. And yet, people continually talk about trauma in different ways. It, it, I think uh, the, the, it is about us recognizing the perspective from which we listen and staying attuned. So, for instance, along these kind of lines, um, I've, I've started collecting um, dreams about the war. You know, and it's, it's, it's a very kind of sideway entrance point, or like through poetry, you know, that's seemingly not head on, but you know, it's, you, know, you, you, you keep connecting certain things thematically and enabling speech to happen. I don't know if I have an answer for your question, but I still believe that staying in dialogue in sense of Mikhail Bakhtin, which means ever questioning your truth and the truth of the other, is if not an answer to your question, at least the route we should pursue. Because we couldn't impose another dominant discourse, see things from my perspective. And we should be very, very strict and reflective not to do that. So the only possible approach is an invitation to talk about. Well, of course, I do not have an answer to your questions, but um, I mean, working and talking about what we are doing, and I, I'm not sure whether y you, the message of what TTM is and used to be came over. It meant people starting to talk whose parents just killed each other a couple of years ago. And that's the idea. And it is just always someone who starts talking. And little by little, others join in. Yeah, I think uh, same as all my predecessors, no positive solution available. But uh, giving space to, to talk in, openly talking and also dis talking in a disturbed way, open to disturb disturbances. But in this way, we managed to have around 700 students through our summer schools in the, in, the, in the course of the years. And they were not just present for a short presentation, but for a week, a week full of experiences and a week full of discussions and also sometimes really disturbing experiences. And we published a book, and uh, maybe this is a commercial now, the, now the commercial block begins. 
uh, we, we will sell you the book if you like to have it for 10 euro less than you would have to pay. Discount, we, I passed on my author's discount to the TTM, <laughs> and so you can get, get it for 32 instead of 42 euros. Read a book, hand it to your friends. So that's maybe another thing. It's not a book of solutions. It's a book of questions. Thank you very much. And maybe I can take the privilege of the chair to g make a proposal, because the question was for, the current, for our current political situation as well. And I think the example which you gave of splitting, of topographic splitting in this Munich situation is very typical, and you can take it for an internal problem as well. It's an expression, an outside expression. But those who are, for very good humanistic reasons, uh, for integrating refugees and to help and assist them, which is very, very necessary, uh, even with our history and so on. But what, in my mind, many of us forgot is, where are our borders? And this is what Pegida does. They cry. And in your situation, there are people who say, let them come in and we have to help them. Fine. And the others are crying. They say, no, we have to keep our borders. And this is a split. And to overcome this split could be very helpful. And to start with oneself. Where is my border of integration, for example? To make this aware, maybe this is a little recipe a little answer to this question. Okay, thank you very much for participating and for this discussion. Thank you.